Well, it's really a pleasure to have this invitation and to be on a campus that uh, I've watched uh, grow from uh, something much less to something just fantastic. And I think um, I was uh, chair of the Board of Regents the year that uh, we acquired the uh, Fitzsimmons. And um, we had a great celebration uh, with many fewer buildings um, and the uh, mayor of Aurora and the general from the U.S. Army who uh, cut a big cake with his ceremonial sword. And uh, President uh, Beekner and I were uh, standing next to him and uh, invited to give remarks about the future of this place. And it's just everything that we'd ever hoped it would be. And I've uh, benefited as a patient and as a citizen. And uh, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Uh, I've come not to um, try to um, meet all of your needs. Uh, I can meet some of them. And I'm going to introduce some ideas that the other speakers will um, discuss in more detail. Um, I'm uh, going to focus on the purification, the analysis and properties, as well as the delivery of cannabinoids, which are isolated from cannabis sativa. And I'm going to um, uh, start out with a little bit of chemistry that uh, one of my fans told me is sure to turn off everyone because it's <laughs> chemistry and everybody knows what a, what a, 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 a tough uh, course uh, organic chemistry is. And, uh, but let's go and I promise that there won't be too many of these slides and uh, we'll get on and let uh, the experts speak about the details of each of these. So let's see if I know how to do this now. Well, no, I'm not there yet. You're just going to roll down. I hold it down. Just roll. roll down and I roll it back. Okay. I don't know whether and why this um, is um, uh, double printed here, but uh, we'll hope there aren't too many cases of this. Um, one of the things that we've spent uh, a lot of time on is trying to see if we could uh, perfect ways to uh, make very pure samples of the individual cannabinoids, which uh, then would be pharmacologically um, probably more useful and certainly uh, give us, us reference standards that uh, would allow us to um, formulate uh, things um, in ways that they can be delivered and know what the dose is and know what the bioavailability is and several of these concepts that we're going to talk a little bit more about. Well, this is um, cannabidiol, the second most abundant of the cannabinoids. There are about a hundred uh, different compounds that you're going to see in a minute the structures of in some measure. And um, this is the pure sample that we've worked on. And uh, one of the indications of how pure it is is how narrow the melting point is. And so this is, melts crisply 69 to 70 degrees. Uh, most people think that um, they're smelling um, the cannabinoid uh, when they smell um, someone smoking or someone vaping or when they um, <coughs> detect um, a compound in the room that uh, is not uh, uh, usually common to the room. <laughs> and um, in fact, uh, what you're smelling is probably the terpenoids, which are also present in large numbers, less than 100, but certainly in the high teens, uh, high tens. Um, and uh, I'll show you the, the structures of those uh, most common ones in, in just a moment. So let's go forward. Well, this is the one that turn off slides, so I'm going to move out of this as soon as I can. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you see um, the uh, precursors, which then uh, lead as you go down around in sort of a counterclockwise way to cannabidiolic acid, which is the carboxylic acid form without um, having uh, heated uh, to activate or to remove the carbon dioxide, which forms then cannabidiol. 
one of, the, well, probably the most um, uh, relevant of the medically important um, uh, cannabinoids. Just to its right, there's delta 9 THC, which is um, the psychoactive uh, material that um, we need to stop right now and make sure all of you know the difference between, um, between marijuana and industrial hemp. So it is simple and straightforward, but not everyone uh, necessarily agrees, even in our government. Uh, and um, the uh, definition of marijuana is cannabis sativa L with um, more than or equal to 0.3% THC, this structure here at the bottom that you see. And there are two different geometric isomers that you see at the bottom. And again, I need to credit Laura Borgelt from this campus who was very kind and let me uh, borrow uh, some of her slides, which I found very helpful. So um, let's move on now to the next one. I said there were other things that you smelled, and things like um, alpha pinene in the very center of this uh, gamish um, is certainly common to us uh, from pine forests uh, around us. Uh, menthol, we all know from everything that, like a cold aid to uh, uh, something that uh, gives flavor to uh, mints or that sort of thing. Um, myrcene is one of the most common of the, of the um, terpenoids uh, in um, accompanying the cannabinoids. Uh, eucalyptol on the far right uh, is um, also well known uh, as the fragrance you smell around the eucalyptus trees and also again in breath mints and so on. So this is just, uh, these are thought to be more, what, mood enhancers if you're using it recreationally. Um, um, maybe, uh, maybe active, or maybe not, maybe they're, um, maybe they're inert, but uh, in any event, you notice them and um, when you smell them, you know you smell something that you may think is the cannabinoids, incorrectly. Now we're going to move away from these. All right, this is an example of one of the tools that we use. The most common analytical tools uh, in our toolkit are high-performance liquid chromatography for the cannabinoids, gas chromatography for the terpenoids, Nuclear magnetic resonance is something I'm going to spend some time on today because it gives us a powerful new tool that is not generally used and there's a good reason for it. Uh, the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectrometers uh, cost about 10 times as much as the high performance liquid chromatographs. Uh, they're in the same ballpark with, uh, with mass spectrometers attached to, to either a liquid chromatograph or a gas chromatograph. Uh, but that does um, cause, uh, give one pause, but look at the enormous richness of this uh, plot. Um, <clears throat> each of these is a, an absorbance of energy. The, the NMR experiment, I should back up, is, and <laughs> this wasn't invented when I was in college, which is a long time ago, um, is a, um, it's a superposition of a sample that we usually spin to, um, uh, to give us um, a, uh, a sample that then can be activated. It's uh, a superposition of a high magnetic field, which is why they cost so much, there are superconductors, and RF frequency, and at certain combinations of that, uh, the pictures you see in the textbook are tops flipping over that are spinning. And, and you, you get uh, the absorbance of energy, and that those are very sensitive, sensitively and exquisitely unique to the compounds that you're looking at. You can alter these, as we did in the 1970s, in patents that my students and I have, um, with what are called NMR shift reagents, which are uh, ferromagnetic lanthanide ions, like europium-3, 
or ytterbium-3, or praseodymium-3, all of which, because they impose their own local magnetic field differences on a nucleus of either protons or of carbon-13s, most typically. Uh, these are the two most uh, studied of the uh, NMR, um, uh, the uh, NMR analysis. Uh, we'll come back to this in a moment, but let's go on because I want to get to other things. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, I've already said no more than 0.3% THC. You can have as much CBD as you can purify out. It can be 100% CBD or near to that. Um, it's tough to get the last traces of impurities out of any of the cannabinoids. Um, marijuana is more than 0.3%, so you have to focus on the THC or THCA, which is considered a precursor. That's um, the uh, carboxylic acid uh, form uh, before it's activated to uh, give you THC. Um, okay, cannabidiol is not psychoactive nor habit forming and anywhere near the way that THC is. And so there's a very fundamental difference that we have to recognize even though people like to deliberately confuse them at times for a variety of reasons. Um, what is this field to Colorado? or either to any state in the, in the U.S. In the state of Colorado, the industrial hemp and marijuana industries created revenues in 2016, totaling $1 billion, and we're already over that in the next year. And just to give you a reference point, all residential construction in the state is about the same. All sales of grains in the state of Colorado are about equal to this new field. So it's terribly important that we get it right, that we treat it right, and that we um, uh, don't end up pe putting people in prison for the wrong reasons. Okay, I'm really inept here. All right, this is an important slide. In 2017, these yellow-green states are the ones um, where marijuana and or <coughs> CBD are now legalized. And the yellow ones are allowing cultivation of hemp for commercial research or for pilot programs that I'll discuss more in a moment. And the green ones either don't allow that um, or have special provisions for CBD only to be studied and not for uh, TH or used for medical purposes in, in a lot of the states that are gray here. But this is terribly important. So there are at least 33 states that uh, make up uh, the bulk of the population in the United States. We're way over 50%. So when you consider that California has now passed it, New York, uh, the, most, uh, the most populous states, um, now allow um, some use of, um, of the cannabinoids, but by, by state law action usually and not by generally agreed federal action. So that's where the rub comes, so I'll come back to that. Well, I have now managed to exceed my limit of mistakes. <laughs> <coughs> What do we do about the fact that uh, me standing here encouraging you to go out and grow and cultivate and study uh, cannabis, um, what, what risk does that put me at and you at? Uh, the simple answer is that I have a, a little technique that makes no health claims. I allow uh, the quotes to be given to you, and you can assess them for yourselves, and you can see whether you agree or not. And, but I'm not, I'm not advocating 
the use of any of these for the simple fact that uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration and the National Institute of Drug Abuse are out of step with uh, virtually all the state laws. <coughs> but um, the head of um, NIDA, Nora Volkow, uh, testified at a Senate caucus on the <coughs> National Narcotics Control in June of 2015 that the NIH recognizes the need for additional research on the therapeutic effects of CBD. And how many times have we heard that there are no beneficial uh, uses of any of the cannabinoids, and that's why it's a Schedule I drug, and not some lower classification. <coughs> NIH is currently supporting a number of studies on the therapeutic effects as the health risks of cannabinoids. And of course, they spend a lot more money on looking for the health risks than they have on looking for the beneficial properties of any of the cannabinoids. Treatment and substance use disorder, terribly important in the opioids case. And, and you'll hear a little television clip by Yasmin Heard from Mount Sinai Hospital with respect to possible use of CBD as a pain relief alternative to uh, the uh, oxycodone and heroin and to fentanyl and all the, all the opiates. Uh, the attenuation of cognitive defects caused by THC. Again, we're getting older. Look at how many people you know that have Alzheimer's or some other form of uh, dementia. And um, so if there's any way we can reverse the, the, um, the, the damage that is being done to our brains by simply getting older, um, that we ought to be looking at it. Um, I disagree with a lot of things that President Trump has said, but the one thing that I think was most important in his announcement that this is a crisis and we ought to do something about it that the press simply has ignored or failed to pick up on is he said, we need to find substances that are not habit forming, but that alleviate pain. Good heavens is sitting here staring us in the face, as you will see in the, in the video that uh, Yasmin uh, will give shortly. Uh, she also said that neuropathic pain due to spinal cord injury. Mitigating the impact of cannabis on risk for schizophrenia. Um, my God, we've got all these people who are half crazy running around here. And we have failed as a country, in my opinion. From the time we had county farms where we at least hospitalized our mentally ill people and tried to help them instead of throwing them in prison. Uh, what has happened to our country? We've failed in a lot of ways. Examination of the potential of CBD as an anti-epileptic treatment. That clinical trial is done now. It is no longer in question whether there is a medical benefit to reduction of seizures in serious forms of epilepsy. What are we waiting on? Why are we lying to the public about this? Okay, this is an example of all the different things that have been claimed. I don't claim that all of them are valid or well demonstrated. And um, I'm uh, going to quickly just suggest that you look uh, at the full range of things here. Gliomas, all right, these are things like glioblastoma, the most serious and aggressive form of brain tumors. Um, there's a patent that has been issued, a U.S. patent to GW Pharma on the use of CBD to treat glioblastoma. Alzheimer's, fibromyalgia, hepatitis, diabetes, uh, MRSA, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, sleep apnea, hypertension, uh, chronic pain, 
uh, got to be one of the most important and and, uh, and properly addressed uh, issues we have in society today, chronic pain. Today is Veterans Day. And I thank all of you who are veterans who have served in public service in either uniform or Peace Corps or uh, all the different ways that we do public service. But we have not treated our veterans who are coming back in any way near the way they deserve to be treated. We cannot, as physicians, give the advice that we know our patients need. So there are all these reasons that, uh, that uh, I go to sleep at night uh, not very happy about the situation. Okay, others will talk about the endogenous cannabinoid system, and uh, I want to make sure I get to um, the videos, so I'm going to uh, just quickly over this. The endogenous meaning, of course, present in each of us, whether we use any drug or not. Cannabinoids and their receptors are found throughout the body, in the brains, connective tissues, glands, immune cells, and in each tissue, the cannabinoid system performs different tasks, but the goal is all, always homeostasis. When cannabinoid receptors are stimulated, we have a variety of physiologic processes, and the CB1 receptors, uh, nervous system, connective tissues, glands, organs, are different from the CBD receptors in the immune system and associated structures. So these two things at the bottom are the, the bullet points, uh, um, are um, hard to pronounce, but uh, I, I'll use the abbreviation 2AG for the second one, and, and then I can't pronounce it, so you pronounce it. Uh, exogenous uh, cannabinoids stimulate the CB1, CB2, and others. And added cannabinoids also stimulate these in different ways. Um, this is a little repetitious, but again, it's one of Laura's nice slides, and so I wanted to, to add it. Um, some people believe, and, and I don't know what to think of the data, but um, that um, certain cannabinoids and mixtures of cannabinoids can improve your sleep. Uh, I'm dead convinced uh, about seizure and about neuroprotection, as I'll come to at the uh, end of my talk. Um, doctors for years have used uh, um, cannabinoids to reduce nausea, um, and, and especially in cancer, cancer patients. Um, we know that, um, that cannabinoids are bronchodilators, that they relax muscles and uh, relieve pain. And the, a whole list of things that we can tick off, there are any inflammatories, there are any oxidants, there are any proliferative, and you can name the rest of them because uh, you've heard them or at least uh, know something about them. Okay, I've talked a lot about decarboxylation and it's, um, I'll move over here for a moment. It's this carboxylic acid group. I found the hot spot. Uh, and it comes off of this phenyl ring. And there's, uh, of course, a carbon here, carbon attached to C double bond O and C and the OH. So this is what we call, of course, a par carboxyl group. Wonderful. And so this lives out. How's that? <laughs> that. All right. So uh, we split this out, and this proton goes on here, and then that becomes, instead of uh, cannabidiolic acid, CBDA, which is present in the plant in various concentrations, to CBD, uh, which has this interesting structure. And of course, uh, whether this is open or closed or not is important in the difference with, uh, from THC. And you have in this one, olefinic uh, uh, protons, 
um, here and here. You have our aromatic protons, all of which have characteristic peaks in the NMR spectrum. Uh, and then you have an alkyl chain, and sometimes this can be shorter or longer. And so that gives rise to this great uh, rich uh, combination of compounds. So at 130 degrees, it's easy. You can heat it. You can do it in a crock pot. Mm -hmm. And you can make salve from uh, whatever <coughs> your, your pleasure is from uh, 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 coconut oil or from other oils uh, which uh, can be uh, applied uh, to your skin and have uh, transdermal uh, dosing. And we have a whole array of dosing, some more, some less effective, faster or slower, going at different rates, more bioavailable or less, and those are all important. Okay, this is uh, a typical um, HPLC uh, plot, and um, it uh, shows um, that uh, this is a pretty uh, um, high CBDA uh, containing 13% um, substance. And then there are a whole bunch of unlabeled things. We typically analyze by HPLC, maybe 11 or 12 of uh, the most common uh, cannabinoids. And then there are all these others, there are plant waxes, there are a variety of things that have been identified. And uh, actually, in the Polish literature, there's fascinating article that Ed uh from uh, the University of Colorado has uh, loaned us and I'll share with you to see what a lot of other things are that are present uh, but not usually identified or analyzed and that's in some cases because there's no real reason to, they don't seem to be a hazard. Okay. This is Garrett Hauser, my field mate. We have parallel plots, uh, and uh, um, the uh, family is here today. Hold up your hands, all family. <laughs> Good. Well, this is drying the hemp in the in the barn, and uh, and uh, so we've just brought in the crop. And it's dry. And it's ready to be extracted now, and. Um, I greatly appreciate the help that that family has given in, uh, in uh, allowing us to, uh, to gather the crop. Uh, NMR apparatus, uh, the only thing to note is that uh, uh, these are um, expensive. <laughs> $300,000 typically. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but uh, just note that these different protons, whether they are they're olefinic, uh, they appear in sort of the center of the plot here. Uh, downfield is to the left, always on an NMR plot by convention. And the reference materials are top tetramethylsilane in the case of protons and uh, um, derivative chloroform in the case of C13. Uh, but let's go on and just show you that this can be like barcodes. Um, this is an important slide uh, because, of course, we always have to be on guard about adulteration of um, materials that are being taken. And you've seen the plots that have been mostly to the right with peaks of the cannabinoids. And then there are blank spots before this cluster that's called fentanyl down here. Fentanyl has peaks that are because of the nitrogen, the basic nitrogen in the structures of all the opiates, <coughs> I guess all of them. Fentanyl, opium, morphine, heroin, um, they all have peaks down in this lower range and they are just like fingerprints. And so, you can spot uh, the adulteration, the presence of something that shouldn't be there. Um, sometimes it's unethical, 
drug dealers. Sometimes it's accidental contamination. Um, but nonetheless, this is a very important slide because it gives you a new handle, a new way to approach besides the other uh, uh, methods that are being used now. And I'm going to race on because I want to get to the, these are NMRs of uh, the carbon 13, and you can imagine that this could even be machine red, and each of these is a different carbon in its structure. Um, you can detect um, solvent impurities, again, by proton NMR, and you can move these around if you choose to add a little bit of your chelate to shift it so that you know whether it is, it, it, it is uh, something that has uh, an oxygen in it, for example. All right, this is my daughter's picture of the crop that uh, Garrett just helped harvest. And this is a picture of sexual versus asexual reproduction of auto 2, which is the particular strain we've been studying. And this is uh, Ed Wassum's um, yummy variety uh, in, in uh, Broomfield County. And this is the work of Daniela, I know you're here. Hold up your hand, where are you? Daniela Bergera, where are you? You must have left already. Okay. <laughs> uh, at any rate, Daniela and uh, Nolan Kane, is Nolan present? No, okay. Uh, at any rate, they've done a wonderful job of measuring the genome of a whole bunch of different uh, cannabinoids and uh, this is a sort of statistical analysis of the, the different uh, phenotypes. All right, you're going to hear these talks, so I'm not going to go through them individually. And it's time to go on past this because we can talk about law in the session. Um, but let's go to post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans and veteran suicides. And Monica Flesch, uh, Fleschner at the University of Colorado um, is uh, planning to conduct uh, preclinical research on stress and PTSD using CBD delivery to rats as a model for human PTSD. And I think she's gotten approval to do that now, and others have been funded as well. Lamont Miller and Sue Sisley and Doblin uh, in California. Tra traumatic brain injury references. Okay, I said I was convinced that, that, um, that there are things that can act as neuroregenerative agents. And some of them are just published in the last month, and I'll show you the paper if you should see me afterwards, that, um, that uh, give you the evidence, both MRI as well as the presence of, um, of uh, the specific um, uh, enzymes that are indicative of um, uh, brain injury and the fact that uh, you can alter this by uh, treating with THC. And we are going to go on now to the, the um, slide here. That's it in my presentation. Thank you.